So I don't know if anyone has ever thought about jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. If you have, I hope you also thought about wearing a parachute because that's kind of important. And always watch the person who packs your parachute. They need to put a face to the job. Okay? They need to know who they're packing the chute for. Okay? Yeah. It, it makes it a little more personal. They take it a little more seriously. Kind of important that it opens. Okay, so um, we have a skydiver who jumps out of a plane moving at 90 meters per second and is 10,000 meters above the ground. How fast will the diver be falling when he is 8,000 meters above the ground, assuming he has not opened his chute? Essentially meaning there's no friction and energy is conserved between 10,000 meters and 8,000 meters. Okay? Let's see if we can give that one a try, see what we remember from yesterday, and we'll walk through that. Okay? Also a reminder for those of you who were not here yesterday, okay, that I had to move the unit exam. I did not realize that we had a uh, grade level mass on the morning of the 26th, so I have bumped it back to the 25th. Okay. We will still be done the unit in plenty of time, and I'll still do the unit review on Friday. Okay. Just know that it will be on Wednesday. Okay. So, we have a skydiver jumps out of a plane. So this is just, there's no ramp, there's no roller coaster, this is plummeting from our initial point here, where our height is 10,000 meters, and our initial speed is 90 meters per second. Okay. Does it matter that that 90 meters per second isn't down? Like, if, when you jump out of a plane, you move at the same speed the plane is moving. That's actually horizontal. Okay. Does that matter? Doesn't make any difference. Energy is scalar doesn't care what direction you're moving, just how fast you're going. That's what determines how much kinetic energy you have. Okay? And obviously the path the skydiver will follow is not vertical. Okay? They're going to do this. Just like the car from yesterday, but I won't do the screen this time. Okay? Because they're going to open their parachute and that's not going to happen. Right? But they are going to have a projectile arc like that. So their velocity initial, their initial speed, sorry, will contribute to their final speed as well as gravity. Okay, uh, and then here at the end, we know our final height is 8,000 meters, so they're falling two vertical kilometers, and we are looking for their final speed. Okay. All right, now we are, of course, assuming that this skydiver is jumping into a vacuum, because if they jumped out into air, this doesn't happen. You don't fall two vertical kilometers accelerating all the way. Okay. You stop accelerating after maybe 100 meters or so, you reach your terminal velocity and you fall at that speed all the way to the ground. Incidentally, skydiving in a vacuum does not work like skydiving in the air. Opening your parachute will do nothing in a vacuum because there's no air to fill it up and slow you down. It'll just do nothing. It won't even come out of the pack. It's actually the drag from the drogue chute that comes out first that actually pulls the um, parachute out of the pack. So, this is happening in the perfect physical world where all energy is conserved, there's no air resistance, there's no work being done, okay? the initial mechanical energy equals the final mechanical energy. So we've got M times G times H initial plus one half MV initial squared, actually sorry, I skipped a step, uh, I skipped a step, okay, um, we've got initial potential plus initial kinetic equals final potential plus final kinetic. All right, what we're looking for is part of which one? Kinetic, kinetic, kinetic final. All right, so I want to get kinetic final by itself. That means I've got to move potential final. How do I move potential final? Subtract it over. Okay, I think we're getting the hang of this, guys. EPI plus EKI equals, oh, sorry, um, minus EP final equals EK final. All right, and now, what's my next step? Expand. Expand. Yeah, okay, put in all the formulas. So M times G times H initial plus one half. MV initial squared minus M times G times H final equals one half MV final squared. Okay, 
Did they tell me the mass of the skydiver? Good, because it doesn't matter. Or it's whatever you want it to be. Okay? It can be a really skinny skydiver or not such a skinny skydiver. It makes no difference. The mass does not matter. Okay? So I'm canceling that, and I'm just looking for VF. So what do I have to do with the one half? Divide it over. Okay. And then what? Square root. Okay, are we starting to really see the pattern here? Okay, like there's really only two things you can be asked to calculate, speed or height. And calculating final or initial is the same. Okay, so uh, VF will then equal 9.81 times 10,000 meters plus 1 half times 90 squared minus um, 9.81 times 8,000 meters divided by 1 half. Sorry, I forgot to start my calculator. That's fast, okay? It's probably faster than you could actually fall due to terminal velocity, okay? You would probably not move at that rate of speed, um, but it's pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty fast, yeah. okay? Uh, so 217.6 meters per second would be the final speed or the speed at 8,000 meters. Okay, sorry, what was it, 2017 meters per second. Okay, is it possible to fall faster than that? It is, as long as you fall from space, okay, where the air is thinner, like the guy I'm about to show you. The Red Bull Felix Baumgartner guy? I he was going supersonic, so faster than the speed of sound, okay. um, which you can only do in the upper atmosphere where the air is very thin and the speed of sound is much lower. Okay. The speed of sound decreases with altitude and temperature. So the thinner the air gets and the colder the air gets, the slower the speed of sound is. Trying to do the speed of sound as a person near the Earth's surface would be deadly. Okay. When they were first trying to break the sound barrier, they test pilots were killed left, right, and center because the planes couldn't take the stuff punching through the, the wall of air that formed in front of them. Wait, did he jump from space? Was he diving? He had a suit. He had a space suit. That's, that's, that's not space suit. Well, I mean, he also uh, went up in a balloon, so he wasn't orbiting. The big thing with burning up on entering the Earth's atmosphere is how fast you're going when you hit the Earth's atmosphere. And certainly his suit would have built up heat as he fell, but not enough. And it was, of course, a specially designed suit that could keep him safe. Um, but when you know a meteor burns off or a satellite falls from orbit, they're moving at around seven kilometers per second if it's a satellite to stay in orbit. Okay. Um, so when they hit the Earth's atmosphere at that speed, they just burn up. Okay. Like the um, I don't know if you guys have seen like the SR-71. Blackbird, it was a spy plane that the United States used, and it was like super, supersonic. It went like Mach 3 point something. Okay? It could outrun a bullet shot at it. Okay? Um, and so when it would land, the pilot couldn't get out of it right away. They would actually have to cool it down because it would be so hot from traveling through the air that it had to be specially designed so that it wouldn't overheat and essentially incinerate itself. So when you see a rocket launch, the rockets, even though it looks like it's really fast, are actually not going that fast until they get to a pretty high altitude. <coughs> All right, so I'll show you that. We're going to jump from the ground to a maximum height. So 48 inches is what? Uh, four feet.
So we'd be looking at um, a meter. Uh, you know what? Somebody Google it. What's 48 inches in centimeters? Okay, so 1.2192 meters is going to be Michael Jordan's maximum height if he jumps from the ground. Okay, I want you to use law of conservation of energy to figure out how fast he's going when he leaves the ground. Okay, what's the speed he has to generate in order to reach that height? Okay, so on this one here, okay, using law of conservation of energy, we want to calculate Michael Jordan's vertical speed leaving the floor, okay, in order to jump to a height of 1.2192 meters. Okay, so initially he's on the ground, okay, but he's leaving the ground at a high rate of speed. So, what kind of energy does he have? Kinetic only. Okay, all of his kinetic energy, or all of his mechanical energy initial is in the form of kinetic energy because he's still standing on the ground where his height is zero. Okay, when he's at his maximum height, if he jumps straight up in the air, how fast is he going at his maximum height? How fast the mark? Zero, right? Anything at its maximum height, if it's, vert if it's just straight up, Okay? It slows down, slows down, slows down at its maximum height, stops for an instant before actually falling back to the ground. Which means at his maximum height, he has only potential energy. Okay? So this is actually a lot easier mathematically than the roller coaster and sledding questions that we've been doing. Okay? All we have is one half MBI squared equals MGHF. Okay? I don't I didn't tell you how much Michael Jordan weighed in kilograms, or what his mass was in kilograms. Okay? Uh, he was, uh, I think at the end of his career, about 200 pounds, 205 pounds. Okay? I don't know what that is in kilograms, and it doesn't matter, because we don't need it. It cancels. Okay? And we are looking for his initial velocity. So we divide both sides by 1 half, and we square root. Okay? So VI is going to be 9.81 times 1.2192 meters. Divided by one half, square rooted, 4.89 meters per second, straight up. Okay? Obviously, if you're running in a straight line, you can run way faster than that. But to jump and propel yourself directly against gravity at that speed is a feat. Okay? All right. Let me have you guys do probably one more, maybe two more conservation of energy questions, and then I'm going to teach you efficiency. Okay. And then tomorrow we're going to do a lab on energy conversion. Friday I'm going to do the unit exam review. Tuesday we'll see if we need to clean anything up, maybe do a couple more work energy theorem problems. Wednesday is your test. Okay. So that's where we're headed here for the next week. Okay, this was an exam question years ago. Give it a try. You know, 650 kilogram roller coaster at the is at the top of a 55 meter hill, rolling at four and a half meters per second. What will its height be <coughs> when it's traveling at 20.5 meters per second? So, law of conservation of energy. Okay. So on this one here, we've got a roller coaster. Okay. We know that initially it's here. Okay, on top of a 55.0 meter high hill, so that will be our initial height, and it's moving at an initial speed of 4.5 meters per second. Right? We're looking for what's the height when it's traveling at 20.5 meters per second. Okay, so since there's no mention of force, no mention of distance, no mention of work, we know the initial energy and the final energy must be equal. Because there's no changes in energy. Do I have energy, kinetic energy at the beginning? Do I have potential energy at the beginning? 
Yes. Do I have potential energy at the end? Probably. Okay. And do I have kinetic energy at the end? Okay. So none of them are zero. Okay. So we've got to put them all in. EP initial plus EK initial equals EP final plus EK final. Okay. What I'm looking for is part of EP final because I'm looking for the final height. So what do I have to do with EK? Subtract it over to the other side. All right. So EP initial plus EK initial minus EK final equals EP final. All right. What do I do next? Now I expand. Okay, so I'm going to go M times G times H initial plus one half MV initial squared minus one half MV final squared equals M times G times H final. Even though I was given the mass of the roller coaster, I don't need it. I'm just looking for H, so what do I have to do with G? Divide it over to the other side. Right, so looking for HF, so we'll have 9.81 times 55 plus 1 half times 4.5 squared, so there's initial potential, initial kinetic, minus 1 half times 20.5 squared, my final kinetic, divided by 9.81, should give me 34.6 meters. All right, how are we feeling about that? Okay, feeling a bit more comfortable. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to give you guys about a five-minute break here, and then I'm going to talk about efficiency. Okay. So 9:40. We're talking about efficiency. Okay. So the last thing in the science 10 physics unit is the concept of efficiency. Okay. Something that um, your generation is probably a lot more familiar with than mine or the generations that came before. Okay. Um, before, it was just about getting a job done. It didn't really matter whether it was efficient or not. Okay. And now, we're very much focused on doing things more efficiently so that we can be you know, better stewards of our resources and our environment and things like that. Okay. So, what efficiency really is, is how much of the energy you put in actually does useful work. All right. So, efficiency is actually measured as a percentage. Okay, so it's calculated in the same way you calculate what your percent is on a test or a lab or whatever. You take what you got and you divide it by what you could have got or what the lab was out of, and then you get the percent that you got right. Okay, well, efficiency works the same way. The efficiency of any energy conversion is essentially the work done or the energy output divided by the energy input. Okay? And it'll come out as a decimal, just like your percentage does. And then you multiply it by 100. We're taking the multiply by 100 part out of this formula, okay? because we know if it comes out to 0.85, it's 85%. Okay? Now, 85% would be a nice goal if we were doing, if we were looking at an energy conversion. Believe it or not, even the simplest conversions of energy, especially mechanical energy, are incredibly inefficient. There's all kinds of places where energy gets lost. In other words, where work is done against what we consider to be non-conservative forces. Okay? We call them that because it makes it look like energy is not conserved. The final energy and the initial energy don't end up being equal like they're supposed to be. Okay? Any, of, any of the forces that cause that to happen end up doing work or having work done to them, and they take energy away. Okay? The energy is not destroyed. It's lost. Okay? It's still there. It's just not doing useful work. Okay? The lab we're going to do tomorrow is going to show you just how inefficient and incredibly simple energy conversion is. We're going to put a cart at the top of a ramp. I know we've done this before, but it's a different cart. Okay? We're going to put a cart at the top of the ramp, and we're going to let it go. And we're going to measure the potential energy at the top, the kinetic energy at the bottom, and compare how efficient it was. Okay? You'd be surprised how much energy is lost as the cart rolls down a, a ramp just over a meter long. Okay? Like most of the time, there's less than 50% of the starting energy at the bottom. 
All it did was roll down a ramp. But when a cart rolls down a ramp, what else do you notice? There's some friction. Yeah, there's friction. How do we know there's friction? Okay. We hear the sound. There's usually some heat generated. Okay, things like that. Those are all things that are taking some of that initial potential energy away. The mechanical energy initial at the top. Okay, gets turned into a lot of other things on the way down. Okay, now, what do you think is a, an acceptable efficiency? Yeah, let's say for a car. I mean, we have we go everywhere by car. So, let, what's an acceptable efficiency for a car? Sixty percent. Okay. It would be awesome if our cars were sixty percent efficient. They're nowhere close to that. Okay. If they're powered completely by an internal combustion engine, they are nowhere near sixty percent efficient. They're nowhere near thirty. A hybrid vehicle might be closer to 30. An electric vehicle is quite a bit more efficient, probably closer to 50, maybe 60. Okay. There's a lot of energy lost. When a car, even an electric car, when it's rolling, does it still make sound? Yes. yes. Okay. There's, you can hear the, the tires crunching against the ground. Okay. You can sometimes hear the air rushing past it. Okay. In fact, it was a big problem. They don't make nearly as much noise as an internal combustion engine okay, uh, powered vehicle. So they actually have like sometimes little things that make noise on them so people hear them coming. Okay. Have you ever noticed like when a Tesla backs up, it makes a different sound than when it drives forward? Okay. Like it makes kind of a little, not a beeping, it's not like a big truck backing up with a beep, 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 but it's, it's kind of a whistle okay, that it makes when it backs up. Um, hybrid vehicles, when they're in all electric mode, they, they have a sound, I always say it sounds like angels singing, kind of like this, and it just goes along. Okay? Um, so they make these noises just so people can hear them, because they're actually pretty efficient and really don't make that much noise. Okay? So if we're looking at a typical internal combustion engine powered, let's say, mid-size sedan, so four-door car, okay? or maybe a mid-size SUV, when you fire it up, Okay, this is the amount of the energy and the fuel that gets consumed. So let's say you put $100 worth of gas in it. Not difficult at these gas prices. I filled my truck the other day and it made me cry. Okay, granted I have a big tank with my toy trailer, but it still made me cry. I'm sure that like, the people who work at gas stations are like getting used to watching people cry at the pump. Okay? Um, so if I put $100 worth of gas in the car and I turn it on, $33 of that $100 goes straight out the exhaust pipe and does absolutely nothing. Okay? Because what a car is trying to do is turn heat into mechanical energy, which is one of the least efficient ways to convert energy. Okay? So we, we burn the fuel, the fire gets hot, the fire makes the gases expand, the expanding gases push the piston down, and the piston drives the drivetrain, which turns the wheels and powers the car forward. Okay? But there's a lot of hot gas produced when you burn fuel. And it just goes out the exhaust pipe. 33% of the energy in your fuel goes right out the tailpipe without doing anything. Okay? Your car is so inefficient that it has to have a cooling system built into it to keep it from melting down. Okay? That cooling system is powered by a belt. I don't know if you've ever looked under the hood of your car, but there are actually a number of belts, or one big serpentine belt that turns a lot of things. Okay? And one of the things that it turns is the water pump. Okay? It's, some, it's the thing you can hear squealing sometimes on people's cars. You ever come up, like a car pulls up beside you, and it's making this horrid squealing sound? That's the water pump. It's not working. Okay, um, so that gets turned by the belt. Well, the belt gets turned by the engine, and the engine is using fuel to burn energy. 33% of your car's energy is used to keep the car from melting down. Powers the entire cooling system. Okay, so gas goes up the tailpipe, car doesn't melt down, and 66%, $66 of my $100 in fuel are spent. Now, I haven't gone forward yet. Okay. Um, your drivetrain, 
That would be all the moving parts attached to the engine. Have a lot of friction. They represent $10 or 10% of the energy in your fuel loss to sound and heat and other things. Your accessories, that's anything powered by electricity in your car. That's getting to be a bigger and bigger number all the time. Okay? Um, that's all powered by an alternator. It's another thing attached to that belt that turns the water pump and the fan and all that other stuff. Okay? Um, when it turns, it generates electricity. The more load you put on it, the more energy is taken away from your car's engine. Okay? Back before computer control, um, we uh, used to have a um, like car show at the school I used to teach at before this one. And this one guy had such a powerful stereo in his car that he had to put a second alternator on to power the thing. Because if he only had one alternator and the car was idling, it would die okay, under load. The alternator would take so much load that the car couldn't idle. Okay? So he had to put on a second alternator to power the stereo in his 1986 Fox body Mustang 4 banger um, and the stereo was worth more than the truck. He called it his rust stain. And then I watched him break the back hatchback window with his stereo. He had like six subs in the hatch. And he cranked it. And it's like, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the whole back window broke. And this guy was like the most chill student I ever had. He just looked at him like, Oh, cool. <laughs> like, you realize how expensive that window is? That's, that's like an $800 window. All right. Um, so, accessories, 4%. So that's power windows, power door locks, your stereo, your rear window defogger, um, your windshield wipers, heated seats, whatever else you got in there that uses electricity. Okay. Um, that number can be more than 4%. It can be upwards of 10%, depending on how much stuff you have in there. Internal friction within the engine, 6%. Your oil's not been changed recently, okay? Uh, then that number can be higher. It also depends on what kind of oil, conventional or synthetic that you use, okay? That number can be bigger than that. Useful energy that propels the automobile forward, 14%. So you put $100 worth of fuel in your car, $14 of it pushes the car forward. Okay. This is why we're shifting to more efficient ways to power cars. Okay. A hybrid vehicle has both a small internal combustion engine and an electric motor. Okay. Now, how does that make it more efficient? It still has an internal combustion engine. Exactly. The electric motor just assists. Okay? The time when your car uses the most gas is when you're accelerating. So they put a smaller engine in that uses less fuel, and when it needs a little more power, the electric engine kicks in and powers it forward. Okay? You can make a hybrid car that's just as powerful as a car with a big um, internal combustion engine. Okay? But it saves energy because it's way more efficient to generate electricity and use the electric engine to assist the car under those conditions. Now, a hybrid vehicle okay, is really designed to be most efficient in stop and go traffic. If you're just driving on the highway all the time, you're not going to see the same gains as you would if you were driving in stop and go. Same with an electric car. Okay? An electric car. It's great, and it's designed to commute back and forth to work. That's why there's so many here in Okotoks. People driving into Calgary and coming back, it's great for that, okay? But if I need to drive to, um, you know, like Winnipeg, and I don't want to have to stop, except to get gas, well, an electric car's not going to be very good for that because it's going to run out of electricity, and I'm going to have to stop and wait several hours while it charges. Okay? That's the drawback to an electric car, is their range. Okay? I still haven't figured out why they didn't put, why they haven't built solar panels into the roof of the electric cars. Okay? Are they doing that now? That is the thing that's being developed. It's just too inefficient to be very widely applicable. Okay. Because I thought, you know, like you're driving along on the highway, it's a nice sunny day, you get a little extra range by having a solar panel. Or it's parked in the parking lot all day. Charging it up. Okay? Um, so it, there's little things like that that can increase our efficiency. Electric motors are really efficient. 
because they don't convert heat into mechanical energy. They convert electrical energy directly into mechanical energy. They can run at 95% efficiency, okay? Which makes them a lot more um, responsible, let's say, okay? All right, so this is what we were looking at here. This is the formula. So uh, I put work on the top just because that seems to make more sense. It's a term that we use more often. Okay, this is actually useful work output or EM, okay, divided by the work input, the energy input, okay, and then we don't do the multiply by 100 part because we can do that in our head. Okay, so um, here's some example efficiency. So automobile internal combustion engine, these are older numbers. Those numbers are probably closer to like 17 to 20% now. Okay, um, an electric engine can be up to 95% efficient. A reciprocal steam engine, okay, 50 to 75. A steam turbine, about 40. Okay, uh, be again, because we're not using the combustion of fuel to generate heat, to generate, to generate mechanical energy. Every time you convert energy from one form to another, energy is lost in the conversion. No conversion is 100% efficient. So, in an internal combustion engine, we go from chemical energy to thermal energy to mechanical energy. That's three energy conversions, okay? Or three different forms of energy, two conversions, okay? Everyone follow me there? If I have an electric car, I convert electricity into mechanical energy. That's one conversion, okay? That's more efficient, okay? The more times I convert energy, the more of it I lose, right? It's also why um, we're looking to use less like coal to generate electricity. Now, I mean, if we use natural gas, it's cleaner, but it's still the same number of changes. I go from chemical energy to thermal energy, okay? That thermal energy evaporates water into steam, okay? The steam turns a turbine, okay? The turbine's mechanical energy converts to electrical energy. It's a lot of conversions of energy. Whereas a hydroelectric dam takes potential energy turns it into electrical energy, okay? So it's quick. Uh, a solar panel turns sunlight directly into electrical energy, okay? One conversion. So the, the fewer conversions we have, the more efficient something can be, okay? Is that sort of making sense to everybody? Okay, so that's what we, we're always trying to do with how we do things. So we're trying to make them more efficient, okay? Now, um, what kind of light bulbs do you guys have in your house? Yeah, pretty much everybody's got LEDs now, okay? Why? Fluorescent are ineffective and they have mercury in them, okay? They're, they're bad, okay? Um, and then what's the other kind? Yeah, the incandescent ones, yeah. Okay, like the old like Thomas Edison filament style, okay? Well, in the Thomas Edison style light bulb, electricity goes through a um, metal called tungsten. Tungsten is an incredibly poor conductor of electricity. So as the electrons try to go through the tungsten, they get slowed down a lot. And when they get slowed down, they give off their kinetic energy as heat, which makes the tungsten filament glow. Okay? But it's only glowing because it's ridiculously hot, white hot. Okay? We're making light from electricity or from thermal energy essentially, okay? It's highly inefficient. One 60 watt light bulb uses 60 joules of energy every second. If I put in a four watt LED, I'm getting the same number of lumens, that's the same amount of light, but I'm only using four joules per second instead, okay? It's more efficient. There's better ways to convert energy into other forms and that's what we're trying to do. Okay, so if I want to calculate efficiency, okay, that's the formula. It's on your formula sheet, okay? Efficiency means take the work that actually gets done, divide it by the energy that was used to do it, smaller number over top of bigger number. If you ever do an efficiency calculation and you get a number greater than one, what did you just do? you broke the law of conservation of energy. If you get a number greater than one, that means you are more than 100% efficient. It means you are creating energy, okay? You cannot do that, okay? So if you ever get a number greater than one, you did something wrong. You probably reversed the two numbers, okay? Smaller number on the top, bigger number on the bottom. 
Okay, um, for tomorrow, okay, we're going to be doing the lab. It means we're going to have to be on the floor because that's where our ramps and carts and everything will be. Uh, so make sure you dress appropriately, okay, because you're going to be like on your hands and knees and whatever on the floor doing the lab. So um, just think about that when you're picking out your clothes for tomorrow. Um, also, I will post the review package for the exam today, and I will post tomorrow's quiz after school today. Okay? So be on the lookout for those things. Uh,